Welcome to season three of Time and Materials, a construction only podcast that's powered by livecost.com, where we sit down with interesting people doing interesting things in construction. These construction experts kindly give us their time so that you can walk away with greater insights to make better day to day decisions in your construction career. Hello, you're very welcome to another episode of the Time and Materials podcast. This week, we're joined by Robin Hayhor. So, Robin is a business mentor to a lot of construction companies he's also a podcaster and um, he runs workshops for construction companies and networking events um soon to be both uh, online as well so we want to get robin on he brings a wealth of experience a wealth of knowledge to running construction companies um so we dig into a lot of robin's experience it's a second time on so we're great grateful to have him back for his for a second time around so we dig into all all things construction all things uh, networking some of the issues that construction companies are finding in the market at the moment so sit back enjoy and i hope you get some value from my chat with robin hayhurst Okay, Robin, you're very welcome back. I have to say, welcome back to uh, the podcast. Great to have you back your second time round. So thanks very much again for giving us your time. Well, thanks thanks for inviting me. Um, in fact, strangely enough, I still get people quoting me for things I said on your last last time I appeared on your podcast. Good, good. I mean, for, for, for anyone that hasn't listened to that one, can you just maybe kick off with just a little bit about yourself, what you generally do, and a little bit about your background? Well, uh, I'm Robin Hayhurst. I'm a construction industry coach and mentor. Uh, I run workshops. Uh, I've just started uh, networking evenings. Uh, and I'm a podcaster. So I run a podcast called uh, Bust and Beyond, where I have people on that perhaps have failed in life or in business and kind of find out what they learn from that and what they do next. Is that like a, a construction-only podcast then? It's absolutely not nice for any business. So um i had failure uh in my business in 2015 i learned so much from that in fact i can only do what i can do now because of what i learned from that failure um and i i i use that in the podcast for any business to understand that you know failure is just a part of success everyone's failed so you look at all the icons out there the richard bransons the Alan sugar they've all failed they just don't talk about it a lot yeah i mean there's it's as, as you say it's, it's difficult to spin out consultancy and stuff um especially when you don't have that experience like without focusing on on the negative too much can you talk about about that little that failure you had i mean what what, what was the business what were the reasons for it not working out uh, well it's a it's construction development business and you know it my father had started in 1969, so it was like a member of the family. The business was, in fact, my, my mother always said that uh, if they ever got divorced, she'd cite the business as the other woman. <laughs> um, so I took over the business in about 2005, 2006, something like that. Um, but in 2015, uh, we'd come out of the recession. We didn't have a lot of money. We were doing partnerships uh, because we couldn't fund projects ourselves. Uh, so we would be, become more of a contractor, uh, but in partnership with other people, and someone didn't pay us um, a large amount of money. Now, at the time, I blamed it completely on that. And, and, and there were certain individuals that I blamed it on. And I'm not saying they didn't have some part to play. But looking at it, you know, in hindsight, and after about three years, and I calmed down because it was it was the most terrible thing that happened to me in my life. And, and, and I... I said it says on my podcast, but you know, I lost my father two years ago, and me and my father were just so close. But going bust was worse because I had no control of my father dying. I couldn't do a lot about that. Whereas I had to kind of get up every day and fight to make sure no subcontractors went bust with us. So, um, so it was a really hard thing to do. And but but in hindsight, I look at what I did. I got us in that position. I signed certain contracts I shouldn't have signed. I gave people power over us. Um, I employed some of the wrong people. So there is all that stuff that I now know I did wrong. Is there is, is there one thing you would have done differently that you think would have avoided that? Hmm. There's no one thing. Uh, I wish it was that simple. It's a combination of things that I did wrong. 
And I think that's what I, you know, I do now is I, I work with people um, to do that, um, yeah. to make sure that they don't make those mistakes. And, you know, it's, you know, um, business is about profit, but it's mm -hmm. also about processes, people, and product. So yep. it's really important to get those those things right. And in fact, profit should always come last because if you get the other three things right, you'll make a profit. Yeah. Um, and you know, so really, it's about those three things. So it's about the product you're you're producing. You know, are you really into a quality product? You know, because unfortunately, the industry is known for cowboy builders. Um, and, and I think other industries have their equivalents. Um, and have you got the right people around you? Because the attitude often is, you know, you interview three people for a job and you go, well, yeah, that was the best one. You know, number three was the best one. Yeah, but that's fine. But were they good enough to work for you? Yeah, I mean, that's that, that that's an interesting one there, right? Because, I mean, you, all you hear about at the moment is we're, we're walking through a skills shortage and, you know, we can't find good plasters, brickies, whatever the case might be, right? So when it comes to recruitment then, like, if we're in this sort of reactive state of we just need to get a classroom gang on site quickly or else we're going to fall behind schedule and or we need to employ you know a good project manager but it's not available so i'll just take whatever i can get i mean what recruitment mistakes do you see contractors making out there from the, the groups that you're advising at the moment oh uh, they're all very common mistakes in fact the great thing about workshops is you get to speak to other contractors and when you think you've, you know, you're, you've got one problem and no one else has got that problem, everyone else has got that problem. So it's really, um, it's really a difficult thing for people to, to, to get their head around that everyone's got the same problem. And that's the great thing about workshops, because you're in person, because you can speak to other people, and because there's a bit of a banter going on, um, you learn from other people as well, because then they might not only have the same problem, but they've solved it. So the problems they have are teams, you know, they kind of say, well, yeah, we should really get rid of this guy, but, you know, we don't know if we can replace him. That's not a good enough reason not to get rid of him. You know? Yeah. Um, so teams are really important, getting the best people around you. Um, knowing what to price. So many people waste their time pricing stuff they're never going to win, you know. And and understanding their, their figures, their, their key performance indicators. K K KPIs are so important. And they kind of tell you how you how your kind of business is going so if you drove your car without looking at the speedo and without looking at the um the, the speed in you know on the road the signs you get in all kinds of trouble wouldn't you mm -hmm. people run their company without looking at the speedo yeah without understanding we, what they're doing i have literally only had this conversation with a recent customer we onboarded for <clears throat> the other day job which is live cost um and they they described to me how they track projects, right? And they, they basically said, listen, generally speaking, to be honest with you, we would look at the bank, the bank account and we'd run a general quarterly P&L <clears throat> across the company and that would give us a performance indicator to say, that, listen, we're doing okay. But we knew it wasn't great and we had to get into not just project level tracking, but phase level tracking. And they said they, they, they came across something interesting, which was they had a gang, gang carpenters um, in-house and they, that was their decision. They wanted the carpentry held in-house and the carpenters were all around as they done first fix, second fix, roofing, whatever they could put their hand to pretty much everything, all the joinery, all that type of stuff. And they said, but one of the feedbacks they give us as a company, they said, we, we started to carve that out into first fix, second fix, roofing, joinery elements. And we realized that our guys are terrible on the roof. <laughs> he said, we, we realized that we're just, they're just they're okay, first fix, we're getting through that on budget, we're hit, hitting the milestones. Second fix, they're actually really good, we're making good money there. And he said, but when, when they get up on the roof, they just weren't performing, right? He says, but, but until we carve that out and we said, we've got X amount allowed, allowed on the BOQ on the roof, until we actually track the time and materials against that, now we can start to see that we're not making money on that. So they just made a quick decision. We just bring in a, a subby to do the roof, right? And the subby comes in, gets a fixed price, delivers the roof, and off they go to make money. But I suppose to, to, to your point then, by not looking at those indicators, but not actually breaking stuff down and having a sort of helicopter view on the company rather than looking at where you're actually making money and then what are we pricing for here? What are we actually pricing for? Stay away from the stuff that we don't make money on, sub that out, concentrate on the stuff that we that we can do. So fully agree with that. I mean, the other thing that came to my head there as you were, you were talking to that, Robin, was like, 
culture. And I, I know from speaking to you the last time, you were big on creating a culture, creating a good working environment. Again, like if we think about that skill shortage, how can we do that, right? If, if we just need to be reactive and we can't get a hold of good staff, how do you maintain that culture when it's just really difficult to find people? Well, that's really interesting because um, I don't think it's difficult to find people. I think we go around it the, the wrong way. So if you're going to get someone, a bit of value here, right? So if you're going to get someone to work for your company, you're not getting them off the couch. They're not sitting at home looking for a job. They're working for someone. So you've got to think about what they're missing. Why would they move and work with you? So if we don't lead adverts with for people saying, you know, I want a carpenter that's, you know, got this skill, that skill, sitting gills, blah, 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 blah. You know, you've got to be hardworking, you've got to work 10, 100 million hours a day. And it's not really what people are looking for. So you, you'd be a bit disruptive. So you start with, do you feel valued where you are now? Would you like yeah. to work for a company that not only value you, but will support you to be the very best you can be? Straight away, it's a different advert, isn't it? Yeah. So most people, the reason they move is because they feel undervalued, and that's not just about money. In fact, if it's just about money, they're not the right person for you. But it's about you know recognition. It's about pro progression through the business. Um, it's about you know them feeling that they're important in the team. So it's all those kind of things that are really important. So if we advertise for people in that way, that changes everything. But we don't do that. We're builders. So we just go, yeah, van provided, yeah, good rates of pay, you know. So um, I think there's people out there, there's lots of people out there who are unhappy where they're working, and there's lots of companies that don't value their staff. Lots yeah. of opportunity for other people. Yeah, I mean, it's... Such an interesting point because again, we've we've transitioned from running a construction company now to running a tech company now. And the recruitment in tech is very, very different, right? It's all about go headhunting, right? Go and find people that are in jobs, right? It's all about finding people that are currently employed. They're the ones you that you want. Whereas in the construction company, you are almost nearly taking someone that's just coming off, finishing up a project, or they're just available, right? There's so we, oh yeah, he's available. Very rarely do we actually go head headhunting, I, I would say, in, in that company. You mentioned the the workshops. Tell us tell us about the workshops. What like what what sort of people are there? What's the sort of content? Um, how often do they happen? Uh, well, they happen. Um, they've just started, so they're, they're happening monthly. Uh, once we kind of get the concept really sorted, we're going to roll them out around the country. They're held at the moment in a lovely place called the Hitchin Priory, which is um, Hitchin, Hertfordshire. Um, and it's really for subcontractors, uh, for contractors developers uh, and we kind of give them the skills that they all really have they have building skills they might have a trade uh, they might be in the industry they might have management skills they don't have to run a company so what it is about giving them the skills have the vision of where the company is going so rather than just kind of start a company and grows and it just kind of meanders on and you know you push it and you have a good year and a bad year and we could say right okay where are you going we're going to be in five years' time. How are we going to get there? What pace are we going to get there at? What do you have to do to get there? So we actually plan the journey. Uh, so the, there's different workshops. So we started we, we started yesterday, very successful worship workshop um, on the 24th of uh, January. Uh, the next one's on the 28th of February. Uh, so the next one is, uh, the first one was about planning your five-year business. The second one is about what I call a customer's journey. Very few people have a really robust process in place to deal with their clients, whether that be a professional client or a private client. How do you manage your expectations? How do you make sure they're fully informed? And we take it from the, the absolute, you know, you receive a tender all the way through to hand over the finished project. And there is templates, there is, um, you know, that there is decision-making process taken away from you because it's all done. So it speeds everything up. It means you manage your client, um, and it means that you take on the right projects. Because, of course, taking on the right projects is so important because if, you, um, if you've got a win rate, say, and win rates are a very important KPI, of let's say you had a win rate of 25% and you wanted to do a million pounds worth of work, you'd have to tender four million pounds worth of work. That's a lot of work. The tender. 
But if your win rate was 50%, you only have to tender £2 million worth of work. The quickest way to get your win rate up is not tender stuff, you're not going to win. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have a really robust criteria of stuff that you're not going to tender. So the criteria of what, what you're going to tender and what you're not going to tender. So if you're not in the office, someone else can come along and go, right, okay, um, yeah, it doesn't, yeah, we've got that, got that, doesn't conform to that, yeah, we won't tender that one. Simple as that. So it's, it's, it's about having that criteria that, you know, you basically ticking boxes essentially that says we will go for this, we won't go for this, and um, making sure that you're focusing on stuff that you can actually deliver that you know you can essentially make profit on once once things are wrapped up. Absolutely, and and might be geographical area. It might be some you know some of my clients have um, the criteria they haven't met the client. If they haven't met the client, are they just being used as a test price? Yeah, you know, check price. So you know. I'm not saying that's the right criteria to have, but you know, it's, it works. Would you be bringing in guest speakers on these as well to talk about particular like experts and certain subjects? Um, we, we might do in the future. At the moment, that there's a lot to get through every day. Yeah. So, but we combine it with a networking event in the evening. Um, so that works quite well. So lots of people come to the network event. So we had our first one again on the 24th of January. Uh, and we had over 40 people. And it was great because there was people there, you know, there was contractors looking for electricians, there was electricians looking for contractors, you know, people just uh, talking about uh, software. So, you know, what software are you using to control your costs and, you know, and having discussions mm -hmm. about that. Um, there was lots of really helpful, supportive uh, discussions going on in the room. And would, will they eventually go online as well? Um, the next one, 28, we will offer a virtual, um, yeah, option. So, um, because, uh, we had people come from all around the country. Uh, a lot of those people are very keen to attend, but coming, you know, 300 miles, uh, every, every month is a lot to yeah. ask. So they've asked us to do an online option. So we, we will be doing that for the 28th of February. Fantastic. Yeah, we will we'll make sure we get that linked up in, in a in the show notes as well. So um if if anyone's interested in in in, in signing up for that, um we can certainly get that linked up. And um, we, we like when it comes to the contractors, I suppose, and I suppose one of the unique positions that you're in is you get to speak to a lot of contractors. Um you're networking face to face with a lot of these contractors as well. Um what are the, what problems are they having? What what are you hearing on the ground there? What like what's what's their biggest concerns with the the, the, the market as it stands today? Well, it's very um, different. If you people have got everything right, they've got no problem getting work at the moment. But you do hear people say, I've got a problem getting work. It's most probably because you've got what I call branding. Branding isn't about, by the way, your signage. Branding is about how you're perceived by the outside world. So I've got clients um, who literally are so busy. It's ridiculous. But their clients in the area they work see them as an aspirational purchase. If they're going to have an extension or a house bill, they want them to do it because they're seen as being the very best in the area, the Harrods of construction, the, you know. Um, and other people are struggling a little bit. No one's actually got too, too less work. You know, no one's kind of really struggling, but they're struggling a little bit and they're kind of trying to ramp it up and find out ways of doing it. It's a long process because you've really got to get a name for quality. And you're only as good as your last project. So one of the things that I kind of tell my clients to get a bit of value is to make sure you get testimonials from your clients. But all testimonials aren't equal. So your clients, I can tell you, rather than working it out, are worried about three things. They're worried about the quality that you're going to give them. And remember, cowboy builders, it's on the news, it's, you know, it's on social media, that's all they're thinking. So they're really worried about the quality. They're worried that you're going to go over time because they've always heard that's going to happen, you know, and they're worried about the budget. So if your testimonials, you can get your clients to cover those three areas that you performed really well on budget, you were bang on time and the quality was superb, you will get work when other people won't. So you have six, seven, eight, nine, ten testimonials saying that someone will pay more for you to do it than someone who hasn't got those testimonials because they've got surety. They know it's going to be done to the quality they want. 
they know they're going to get it on time and they know they're not going to kind of the costs aren't going to run away with them yeah had this conversation recently as well like that the whole social proof thing it's so good right when when you're let's say you're talking about a pri private job and i'm in that private job you know we're, we're dealing with mr and mrs jones where they let's call it a one-off bill or whatever it might be um if we can show evidence of previous projects or latest project that you know mr and mrs smith down the road talking about how we performed on time we have done what we said we would do we came in on budget everything was managed i mean the confidence that's going to give the next client it's it's there the, the, the other thing we, we spoke about recently was do you think there's an opportunity being missed with with contractors not documenting that as and i mean documented like creating content for social media and their own website of actually actually documenting projects to show evidence of this is us on site this is where we're up to on this project now we're delivering this like are any of your guys leveraging the social tools and some of the advantage we have now of documenting what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis for the sake of using that as a business development tool absolutely i mean i'm quite jealous of one client i mean i've got about 1500 followers on instagram and it's a slow build if anyone's listening to this they want to follow me I'm, I'm after followers i'd just like to kind of get people to see the stuff i'm putting out there which is of value uh one of my clients has got twenty thousand followers on instagram mm -hmm. because they document things in the right way but they also talk about the challenges they're supporting and the other work they're doing um so you know i mean instagram's where it is if you look at instagram as a website you know don't think about it as a lead generation it will do but it's a slow kind of build but it's a website so you, but you, it's constantly got to be up to date you know if you look at someone's website and you can tell that they haven't changed things for the last you know five months what do you think about the business whereas instagram is really easy to update and keep updated um so you know instagram social media showing how the projects are going showing what projects you've won being proud of your projects i mean that's a simple start just being proud of, proud of your projects is really important um so yeah it's um yeah yeah you have to we were speaking with we speaking speaking with with with, with someone recently it's like it's it's such an opportunity you know he had uh documented something very very simple on a on a project on a TikTok, which you know when i think of TikTok, i sometimes think of younger kids but it it, it just ain't that anymore Four hundred thousand views on a, on a on a simple video uh which is just phenomenal like that them, them types of eyes on the business for something such so simple is it's, it's just huge um always in always an interesting space that that, that one I, I do think is a huge opportunity for for, for construction i think we're slightly behind um other industries that are are uh using that and uh, when it comes to point when it comes to on, online robin if if anyone wants to reach out to you if anyone wants to figure out more about these workshops and uh, some of the stuff you're doing you also do c c consultancy is is that right yeah i mean it's consultancy coaching men i've got mentoring really is what i like to call it um, yeah I've always been told consultants are people that you spend loads of money with to tell you what you already know. <laughs> so I tend not to, uh, but yeah, I mentor people. So, you know, I have huge experience in the industry. Um, I've got a huge experience of life. Um, and it's strange enough, you know, sometimes it's just um, personalities. It's, it's, you know, people, it's a people thing that people are struggling with. Um, but I mean, if people want to get in contact, then, uh, you know, the best way to do it is mostly through my website, which is, uh, uh, www dot obviously uh, Robin Hayhurst H A Y H U I S T dot com. Um, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. Um, so you know any of those mediums, you can contact me through. There's a way of contacting me, um, and I offer um, I offer virtual uh, coaching, but I also offer face to face coaching. Um, so um, I've got kind of something for everyone. And even if you're just starting out. Uh, and you just want to kind of make sure you've got a few things right, I've got digital course. So, um, you know, that's uh, an online course which people can do at their own pace and, and do it. So we're kind of building something to help everybody because um, that's really the kind of what I'm in it for. I, mean, I love I love seeing the results my clients get. I love seeing them go from kind of overwhelmed and perhaps a little bit, you know, not sure about the future to having a really clear vision. Of where they're going and what their future is but i you know, also work with clients that are doing really really well but they want to do better they want to you know so i work from people that are really at the end of the tether and kind of want to know where to go 
to people that are actually at the top of their game, but they understand they need that mentor, they need that kind of that backup to to move even better forward. Last question, and I'm slightly putting you on, on the spot here, but uh, I'll apologize in advance. If I'm coming to you, I'm a bit all over the place. Let's say I'm doing residential developments, right? I'm <clears throat> doing small developments. I'm turning over six million quid. Bit all over the place, not sure exactly where money's coming in, where money's coming out. I'm looking at the bank account. I've got high fluctuation of staff numbers. Um, where do you start with me? Oh, I'd always start with the same place for that. So there's no point if someone is in that situation looking at five year plan. It's important, but not that point. First thing you do is you build the cash flow forecast. So cash flow forecasting is something so many people don't do because it seems difficult. It's not, because we know it's a guess. But you build the cash flow forecast, start to understand the figures, and then you can start to fix things. So you definitely always start with a cash flow forecast, understanding the figures, where you are, what date you've got, and then you can start looking at the team, you can start looking at all the work, you can start looking at the processes. And once things settle down, you can say, right, okay, now we can start looking at where we're going. Yep, and if people want to know more about that and more about the, the courses, the, the workshops, the uh, online events that are going to come on as well, we'll link up those uh, links um, in the in the show notes. But for today, anyway, Robin, listen, thanks very much. Really appreciate your time coming on. Great. It's lovely to be here. Thank you very much. Final Materials is brought to you by LiveCost, the construction software fully designed to manage your construction financial forecasts. Visit LiveCost.com to take a product tour or reach out to our team of construction cost experts to transform your project profits. Any links mentioned during this episode, including speaker profiles or any other resources, are available on the podcast show notes. Your feedback is also welcome. We would really appreciate if you could take a moment to leave us a review or email your comments, guest suggestions, to hello at timeandmaterials.com. Finally, if you haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for listening. Until next time, I'm your host, Kieran Brennan.